for uh, tuning in today or, or watching this later on a, on a rebroadcast on YouTube. Uh, my name is Joshua Leo. I'm Assistant Director for Admissions and Recruitment. And uh, the title of this virtual info session is Ask Us Anything or something to that effect, right? So this is an opportunity. Uh, we had quite a few uh, people who responded to that topic. And so we have quite a few things that we're going to cover in a broad range of topics. And the other thing I want to remind you to do is uh, make sure that you get a chance to, um, that we are, since we're broadcasting live, you can submit some of your questions online to us as well as we cover today's topics. Uh, we have quite a few folks here. Um, at the table to provide a wealth of information and so um, I'd love for you all to introduce yourselves. If you could tell us your name, your role at the Brown School, and just a general overview um, um, the different types of questions that you maybe uh, have the answers to. Hi, I'm Leslie Dueling McCollum. I'm currently the MSW Field Site Coordinator in the Office of Field Education and I'll be eventually shifting into the MPH Program uh, Manager role. Hi, my name is Rachel John. I am currently the MPH Program Manager at the Office of Field Education, and I can answer any questions about all things MPH, curriculum, field education. Um, so here I am. My name is Allie Simpson, and I just finished my first year of my MSW, and my concentration is Children, Youth, and Families. My specialization is System Dynamics, um, so I can answer any questions about student experience and practicum and all that stuff. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hahn, and I'm the administrative assistant for the Office of the Registrar and Office of Financial Aid. And I can answer questions about financial aid, tuition, and registration. Excellent. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate uh, your willingness to give uh, to our prospective admitted students as well. Um, and so we're going to jump right into it. So I have a few things just to lay out there. Um, we're going to start by fielding questions that you all have submitted ahead of time. And then we'll watch out for you all if you decide to submit some questions live. We'll make sure to address those as well. We do have a, a few uh, bits of housekeeping that we want to take advantage of um, with our time with you. So we have some information that we'll want to switch over to if you just give us one moment. Um, we have an enrollment checklist. So we also sent you an email out as you listen. Um, that email should have your enrollment checklist. And so we want you to carefully review your, the enrollment packet um, the, and the course sequencing guides. That email went out last week. If you have not received that email, we encourage you to check your spam, jump folders. And if you want to make the at wustl.edu one of your safe senders, that will ensure hopefully that you will get um, future emails from us in the future as well. Um, just a few dates here just to um, uh, again, some, some important pieces here, of course. To be approved for your classes, you must complete each of the following tasks, and you, you can see a list of that up there. Create your WUSTL key, your, your we call it WUSTL, sorry, W-U-S-T-L um, is WUSTL, so you're welcome now, you're part of the community. Um, create your WUSTL email address. Um, using your WUSTL key, you'll log into WebStack to provide your emergency info, uh, contact info, and then, of course, log in to review the student handbook and sign the student hand agreements. Um, we also want you to um, review the introduction emails for your academic advisor. Um, you will receive this to your will still email within the next two days. So make sure that you get that will still email set up because that's where we're going to do pretty much the rest of our correspondence with you. We won't use your personal emails anymore. We'll start using your uh, Washington University email address. And of course, you want to log into your web stack and create registration worksheets as well. Um, you want to email your academic advisor once you register, for sure, as well. Um, and they'll review with you any um, revisions or questions that you have um, to retrieve their approval registration. Um, we want to remind you that the date for registration is June 20th at 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. All right. So we're going to jump right in and with some questions for this group. And again, please send them in. I know we had quite a few. And so we do hope to get as much answered. And I think this is our final virtual session for the summer. So this is your chance. You can always call our office for sure as well, but uh, we'll get right into it. All right. So the first question I have here is when we do register for classes, and how would we know which courses that we should register for for our respective programs? So um, who would like to take that one? So I know that you will all receive an email in the next two days with your academic advisor who will um, let you know how you should register. And then um, that is, those are the directions that you will need to follow. And it's also in your enrollment packet. Yes, I would just encourage you to review the course sequencing for that first fall semester, which are listed for MSW, MPH, Band Standing, and Dual Degree Students. Um, again, listed in the registration packets that were sent out by admissions. 
Excellent. So you're going to probably hear this theme throughout our time this afternoon, but that enrollment packet is a very critical piece of information as well as the administrative resources page. So make sure you tune into that, log into those um, to make sure that uh, you get a, a lot of information, if, especially if you have any questions after our time together today. All right, so let's talk about the MPH program. It sounds like um, one student wants to know, apparently we need to nominate our specialization now, but what if we're tossing up between two different specializations and want to experience you know, some time here on campus before having to declare um, a specialization? What do we do in that instance? So that's a very good question. If you are going to, um, if you want to specialize in global health, you will actually need to take a course in your first fall semester. So that is a required piece, and that is something you need to start thinking about right now. So if you have any questions, you would want to reach out to the Global Health Chair faculty once your Wistel key is set up, and maybe you can talk about why you're hesitant or if there's any other questions you may have. As for the other specializations, you can take introductory courses that are mandatory in your first semester and then figure out what you need, what you would want to specialize in. You have until November of the fall semester. Um, I'm sorry, there's also another specialization you will need to take a course in, which is urban design. So if you are thinking about global health or urban design um, as a specialization, I would strongly encourage that you contact um, the faculty chair this summer to talk about um, whatever information that you want to discuss about that. The other two, you can actually wait until November to um, think about. Excellent. That's a, that's a great reminder for folks that with those two specializations that earlier on, yeah. they need to um, have some conversations so they can um, definitely declare that. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so next question we have up here is, um, what happens if we're unable to register for a particular class that we want to take? Or will the same class be repeated at a different time? So what's some of, they don't have any experience with that? Um, I can say that we, we work really hard to make sure that you get into the required foundation level courses your first semester. I um, encourage you, if you have any concerns, um, just constantly communicate with your academic advisor, and, and we will work with you. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't had any trouble with the, especially with the foundation courses. There's so many options that I've been able to fit them all in, and I've never had like a sequencing problem of not being able to get into a class that I needed at that time because there's always another option in the later semester or something. That's great. I'm pretty sure that could be a pretty stressful time for folks as they're getting ready to register. So it's good to hear that there's, um, how you've had some success and you can at least work with your advisors. Even if that exact plan that you have, it doesn't work out for that specific semester that they can work with you to try to navigate that over your next two years with our program or more for those of you who are doing joint or dual degree programs. All right. So the next question I have here is about uh, practicum. So what if, um, does the practicum count as one of the four or five classes that students typically take or is this extra? Yeah, I can handle this one. So practicum is really counted as a course. It's helpful to view it as a, a course. You are um, taking a certain number of credits in practicum, usually starting in the spring or the summer, depending on your program. Um, and it's helpful to think of that as part of your course um, schedule for the year. So planning ahead, knowing that you'll have a certain number of hours that you need to complete in addition to um, perhaps three or four other classes of your MSW or maybe independently over the summer if you're MPH. So um, please look at that as a course. It can be really helpful as you're planning your schedule and your academic advisor will help you figure out how that fits in with your other courses as well. Great. Thank you, Lizzie. All right, so I think this one has come up a little bit. We've talked about it, but again, just to, I think repetition is a good thing when it comes to learning. Um, when will I hear from my advisor? Liz, when will they hear from their mm -hmm. advisor? In the next day or two. So we'll receive a, and once again, an email from your academic advisor. It's coming up quick. So this is real. For those of you folks who are going to the register, <laughs> the next couple of days it's going to happen. All right, so we're going to kind of transition over to our, our next topic. Um, and so we have a summer to-do list. So we want to remind you to, again, uh, look out for your enrollment checklist uh, throughout the summer. And then that is available on the Admitted Student Resources page. That's just a, a wonderful resource. If you call our office, we'll definitely be happy to talk you through it. But one of the things that you can do ahead of time, especially after hours, is make sure you tune in and log into the Admitted Student Resources page. We also want to remind you that the orientation email will come out on July 17th 
or at least the week of July 17th. And so you'll need to register for orientation. Orientation takes place, I think, October, tw I'm sorry, August. <laughs> it must be in August, August 21st uh, through the 25th. And so um, you'll need to do that. If there are any proficiency exams that you'd like to take, you'll need to uh, register for those as well. And then also you can get a chance to begin the Brown online orientation learning modules. Um, and so that's something that's relatively new and that's something that we're pretty excited about as well. All right, so we're going to move forward with some additional questions here. And so, you know, actually, since we do have a current student here and we have folks who've gone through the program, let's talk about orientation week. Um, what does it look like? What does it involve um, when we ask you to come a week early? What, what, what do we put you through? Yeah, so I remember it started with the proficiency exams, um, which was just in a computer lab. And then they were long packed days with you would start in a big um, like lecture hall with speeches and um, just going over all the information of registering for classes, um, kind of in more detail, the concentration, specializations, kind of um, meeting all the deans and meeting everybody that you've kind of been reading about now. And then um, and then you do breakout sessions about uh, diversity and um, different things. I can't remember what all the breakout sessions were. And then there was just uh, networking opportunities for culture throughout the whole week. So you'd have like lunch with faculty or um, there'd be happy hours at nights. So it was really, really exhausting, but in a, in a good way. It was, uh, there was like motivational speeches from people working in St. Louis. Actually, my favorite session was like a panel about St. Louis because I'm not from here. So that was cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we have quite a few students who, most of our students don't really come from the St. Louis region, so that's actually very helpful to be here, to be with a lot of people who are dealing with the same transition that you're going through, and to hear from folks about how, what, what there is to take advantage of our, our city is a, a great opportunity. I will say that um, my experience, just observing as an outsider for orientation, is that there were, by maybe midweek to near the end of the week, there were some students who were kind of a little shell-shocked, a little bit, you know, a little <laughs> stunned by the amount of information. Um, but the good thing about it is we throw a lot of information at you in varying ways, and at least you know how to access that information later, or at least you get to know who your go-to people are on campus, know who your resources are, and who can help you as you transition into the Brown School community. Hopefully that, that's helpful, but it is, to your point, a lot of information. Yeah, it's intensive, out. but it's, it's good to have too much information. It is, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. All right, um, so you mentioned proficiency exams, so um, who can speak to this if you can talk about if they're required or not? Research, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, proficiency exams are, are not required. However, we do encourage all students to attempt the proficiency exams. Um, you never know, and it's a great opportunity to free up additional elective credits for your program. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, how do you know um, if you should take a proficiency exam? What's what's a pretty good tell for people whether you chose to take, choose to take them or not? So if you have ever taken a, a theory class or a research class in your undergrad and you have a textbook that you can review all the materials over the summer, you should take it. You're not penalized if you take the class. I mean, if you take the exam and you don't get the grade that you need to test out of it. But what we have heard, and Ali can um, talk about this, is that a lot of students, after they've taken the course, they have expressed regret that they didn't even attempt to take that uh, proficiency exam, especially research methods. Um, take it, you're not going to be penalized. And some of them, it's worth um, reviewing a little bit before, especially research methods if it's been a couple years but some of them even just just go take it like someone mentioned there's nothing to lose there's they give you a lot of time to take it but it might not even take you that long and you might pass it and now that I'm here and there's so many classes I, I want to take I wish I had extra units to take some of these classes so I encourage you to take those that's great. So it sounds like one in doubt, if you think you're, you're close, um, it'd be worth exploring it. And then, then you won't be penalized right. uh, for taking these exams. So it's a pretty safe opportunity for you all to, to be able to free up some credit hours so you can get a deeper dive in some other areas. It's yeah. great. Thank you. All right. So um, this next question is about working on campus and what does it actually look like, but more importantly, finding jobs. So um, when are we able to apply for campus jobs, um, such, as, <laughs> such as working with admissions? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Shout out to admissions. Um, so when can we find out more about that? Um, Kylie, did, did you get a job on campus at all? Yeah, okay. I worked as the um, Peace Corps recruiter in the with the undergrad. So it was on campus, but not in the Brown School. Okay, excellent. How did you find out? What was the timing? What was that process like for you? So I think in July, it was posted through the Brown School Career Center sent out a blast of jobs. 
And so I applied to that one. And it was it was really good to have it all settled and come on like come with a job. But then again, it was I saw my friends who came here and saw the workload and, and then understood how many hours they had in their schedule and then later got jobs. I saw the value in that too. So I don't know, there's arguments either way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's I'll, I'll, we do get quite a few calls from um, students um, who want to um, find out how they can gain employment. So there's some things that you can actually do ahead of time. You can, and I'm looking at my, our, our wonderful leader here, <laughs> she, who's off screen, is gonna queue me up with some things, but um, you can create a simplicity for a profile as soon as you create your whistle key, and, and you can recreate your whistle key now. So simplicity is gonna be a great way to access job information, and apply for jobs online, as well for campus jobs. So we definitely want you to take advantage of that as well. We also wanna throw a few things else out there for you as well. We have a job fair during orientation, which is a great opportunity, it's a part-time job fair. So quite a few employers here who represent on-campus jobs and off-campus jobs in a wide variety of areas, both within the Brown School and outside of the Brown School. Um, so that's a great opportunity for you when you get here. So you don't have to have your job secured prior to getting here. And then, you know, one of the things that you can do even before all of that is, um, this would be a great time to do some informational conversations and to do some networking. And so many of you, as you've gone through this recruitment process and you've gone through this admission process, you've probably heard from members of our team that have encouraged you, maybe other students who have encouraged you to do this, but reaching out to any offices that you're interested in getting any experiences with, reaching out to faculty ahead of time, um, just to do some informational conversations just to learn more about what they do and get your name on the radar for some of those different areas is, is always a good thing. I think it's just, just a professional skill that you should already be taking advantage of as you transition into and through the Brown School. And so we want to encourage you to start practicing those skills right now. I think that networking is, is a critical piece as well. Um, all right. Um, any anyone else have any hints on, or pieces of advice on kind of identifying job opportunities or or connecting with job resources, maybe from your experiences here? Um, our career office of career services is a, a great resource for you. So I definitely encourage you to um, meet Lee and Nicole and Tina in, in that office once you arrive on campus. And, and they're, once again, they're a great resource to help you um, find part time employment on campus and of course employment once you are through with the Brown School, um, but then simplicity and then just as Josh mentioned, network. And, and again, um, for that part-time job fair, if you're awarded federal work study, you can. That's a great way for you to find um, jobs to fulfill that federal work study position as well. Absolutely. And there, and there, are, plenty, there are a wide variety of um, part-time jobs that we've seen. Um, the Gephardt Institute, we've seen Residential Life, we've seen uh, our, it's the it's a diversity and inclusion our office there that, that does um, some really good work. And so there's, again, some really great opportunities that you can connect and um, I think that will be value added to your educational experience as well. Um, all right. We have a, all right. So throughout the time, as you mentioned, we're going to take some, some live questions for you. And so I'm going to take this from my partner over here. Maybe my arm's not long enough. All right, there we go. Survived, and I didn't spill my water. Okay. Question: Is it difficult to manage working part time while also taking classes? That's a fantastic question. That comes up quite a bit from people. So let's talk about that. What is it like to navigate working part time or more? For some people, I guess you might work through quarters time um, and, and and navigating classes. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's tough. The time management is tough, but I think, um, I, you know, it's different for everybody. Some people love it. Some people don't love it. Um, some people have jobs that all of their hours are on, you know, nights and weekends, so still can take advantage of kind of the, like there's always stuff going on at the Brown School. There's networking lunches and um, professional development opportunities. So if, if you work at, um, you know, a restaurant or something where, where you can still go to that stuff during the week, then then that is kind of a way to balance it more. Um, my job did kind of take me away from that stuff more, so that was hard to balance. Um, yeah, I mean, like anything, just when you have limited hours in the week, time management is hard, but you're building skills, and I'm, I'm glad I did it, and I will have a job next year, too, because I think, um, you know, survival. <laughs> <laughs> Paying bills and eating is yeah. <laughs> I love surviving. It's critical. Grad school is really hard, so you want to eat. I think it can be done um, yeah. if you have good time be. management skills. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of our my students 
have some kind of job, um, even when they're in practicum. So it can be done. Yeah. I would say the, most of our students, yeah. Um, yeah. as they fund themselves to graduate school, it, it, employment is a critical piece of that for sure. And, and it usually shows up in a, in a form of part-time work. And so I, I appreciate getting a realistic view on that. It, it does get more challenging when you add in practicum, but there's yeah. ways to work around it where um, you can bleed in your practicum hours into the summer so that you're not having um, it, it, there's just ways to strategize so that you can work however many hours you need to work for what you need to do and then and then still get your practicum hours done. There's there's flexibility. Yeah. You know, and as one of the employers, one, part of that, one of the questions asked about admissions, and so I can only speak on our behalf, but I think this is probably relatively true with some other departments as well. We're used to hiring Brown School graduate students, so we are aware of the flow of your year and of practical ob obligations. And so um, I, ideally, you identify employers who are going to be flexible and will work with you, um, as we know that your priority is, of course, to get these experiences where you can um, give, whether it's through research or practice, as well as gain some experience for your academic um, portfolio, for sure, we want that. And so we know that's a priority. And then also we want you to take our job seriously, but again, I think we're all hopefully reasonable employers that we can work with you as things change um, between semesters and, and semester to semester. Um, another question came about international students, and, and so the question is, are some of these, or this, the question is, is, are all of these employment options open to international students? Um, does anyone have any experience working with that? I mean, I, I can say, you know, for sure, I think that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis thing. I think there's certain visa types um, and credentialing that you'll need and that will allow for some employment, and, and some do not allow for that. I mean, so that's really the extent of kind of where I can feel confident speaking about that. Um, but regardless, these are not our, we don't have, that's going to be between you and your status as a student, your visa status. When it comes to hiring processes, though, there's no, we don't have any restrictions on international students. These opportunities are absolutely open to international students, and oftentimes we do employ international students and then when in doubt contact your advisor at OISS and they will be able to tell you what your restrictions are Absolutely. great questions and again please keep them coming in um, we'll feel them um, for sure thanks for your that. Mm -hmm. all right so we're going to transition a little bit to um, actually slide transition because um, we're going to we talked about how you pay for a place but let's talk about finding a place um, it seems like uh, many landlords and property owners are expecting um, me to come visit the property before leasing. And unfortunately, I'm moving from across the country and won't be able to tour the house, sign the lease, or pay deposit in person. Any advice on navigating the situation? So yeah, we'd love to hear, Ali, for sure, your experience, because it sounds like you had kind of a little bit of an interesting experience, but let's, let's talk that out a little bit. Yeah, we were, we were chatting about this before because I did the same thing, moved into a place sight unseen, and it wasn't exactly what I expected to see when I got there. But um, but now that it's been, anyway, it's fine, but now that it's been a year, um, I kind of realized what I could have done in the past. I mean, we have this Facebook group. Um, we I did find my roommate from the Excel document of all the other Brown School uh, people looking for roommates, and that worked out really, really good. But there's also this Facebook group where I, I could have, um, you know, posted in it. Has anyone lived in this building before? Has anyone worked with this property manager before? So that's that's a way to kind of do a workaround, or just to live in a building that's maybe affili affiliated with Washington, like Quadrangle owns all buildings around here, or um, or just a company that you know a lot of students live in. There's a bunch of those, and I mean, feel free to reach out to me or just that Facebook group because guaranteed that there's a student that's lived in your building before because there's WashU students everywhere and you can ask around. Absolutely. Yeah, I know that that question came up during your Middle Student Weekend. Um, questions about, you know, even, even though those folks were here, uh, some of them had a really short time that they were going to be here and they're deciding on where they were going to live when they came to campus. So they're going back across the country, across the world. Um, and so um, it can be a very stressful thing to try to identify housing when you're away from home. So we definitely acknowledge that. And so at taking advantage of that Facebook page, I think is a critical piece. Um, you can feel free to contact um, other current students if you want us to connect you with current students. Uh, admissions and recruitment can definitely connect you with students. And you can kind of pick the brains of some of them to kind of learn more about how they've identified properties. That Facebook group, I think one of the, I mean, the idea of reaching out to people and, and asking about specific properties is going to be very helpful as well, as well as identifying potential roommates 
in the future as well. There are a lot of different other questions that also come up around like neighborhoods, like what neighborhoods should I live in? And um, really, honestly, there's so many different types of neighborhoods that are close to the um, university as well as within our public transportation of the university, as well as within a short drive. And I know some people who live further out. So I think it's really up to you individually. One person might describe a neighborhood as a little more rustic or a little, you know, whatever, a little more city-like. And, and other people, that might be perfect. That might, you know, I live in the city. I love that idea. And some people might want to live in an area closer to campus like Loop, or to, um, which, which is a very eclectic neighborhood and you have access to a lot of restaurants and shops. And so I think just having conversations on Facebook and with individuals and all of us, we all live, you know, within the San Luis region. So um, we can give you a different perspective on that as well. All right, so the next question I have here, it says um, that if you're able to opt out of the school's student insurance, can you still use the WashU student health services as your personal um, insurance? And so I have a, a little note here that helps me cheat on this. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, students who opt out by demonstrating comprehensive alternative coverage uh, still have access to student health services based on campus. And this includes all of their accommodations, such as 9-3 counseling sessions, a women's health visits, uh, lab and pharmacy work. And then uh, these services are included under your student health and wellness fee. So that is covered even if you're carrying your own insurance. And that actually student health services is on what we refer to as the South 40 of campus, which is actually a walking distance or a short drive from where we're physically at here at the ground school. So it's 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 fairly accessible. Um, and if you have any questions at all, you can contact them if that's a uh, specific concern for you as well. All right, we are going to transition a little bit to talk about um, classroom and student experience. And so again, I mean, Ali, I'm sure this lot of these may point towards you. So we appreciate you taking time to be with us. But I think anybody can really chime in here as it makes sense. So the first question is, um, our lectures recorded via Lectopia or anything similar? Um, I have never taken a class where all lectures were recorded. Um, usually slides are posted either after or the night before, depending on the professor. Um, but I do know students can make a, accommodations with the professor. There's an office where you can make accommodations. So I've seen students do that um, if, if they needed lectures recorded for a certain reason. I think it's called Cornerstone. Yeah is the name of the office where you can make accommodations. Yeah, thoughts on that? I know that Cornerstone's on South 40 as well. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're a fantastic campus partner and a great resource for folks who need accommodations. We definitely will do that. Makes sense. All right. All right, so I think we covered that in the second question about advance or after. It sounds like you get sometimes one or both. Yeah, or depending on both. the <laughs> preparation of the professor you get. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah, yeah, one or the other. All right. Um, are there assigned text uh, textbooks, and if so, um, anywhere we can get them secondhand? So navigating buying books, which I know can often be a really interesting, frustrating thing for, for college students at any level. So what's that like for you here at the Brown School or at WashU? I have done, yes, there's always books assigned. There's usually um, article, also digital articles um, for every class. Uh, and then the books, you can get them at the WashU bookstore or rent them, you can buy them or rent them. Usually I compare that and Chig and Amazon and all the different things and usually have a book from each place wherever it's cheapest. So um, professors are pretty, uh, like they know you don't want to spend a lot of money so they'll do the cheaper edition or um, if there is a digital version, they'll, they'll find a digital version for you. I actually did a lot of digital textbooks which people are either very anti that or very pro that um but it's usually like a third of the price so i did that this year that's great oh that didn't exist when i was in grad school so that, <laughs> that's great yeah i think that's a, that's a great option um, and then i know some students borrow from their second year peers mm -hmm. if you connect with anybody in the second year cohort you can ask to borrow maybe some of their foundation courses by the facebook page mm -hmm. Yeah. Provided the significant cost savings for sure. Yeah. I mean, our library systems are incredible. I mean, we have our own library here at the Brown School that's dedicated towards us. So some of those online articles, we may have potentially have access to some of, we'll have access actually to quite a few things. And one of the things that I've personally experienced recently is speaking with our librarians. I mean, they're just a great resource. And they'll sit down with you and, and literally walk you through how the best access um, periodicals, articles, journal articles, um, anything that you could ever need for research or, or practice. And so um, I just encourage folks to really take advantage of, of them. They're just an invaluable resource to our community. 
All right, so we talk a little bit about intramural sports or um, the question is, are there any more sports for MSW program or any programs that we can join in? If so, um, where do we sign up for these things to take place? And so, um, did you get involved? I was on the grad school flag football team. <laughs> we were very bad. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of up to us. We have access to all of the uh, undergrad intramural team, so it's kind of just up to us if we want to sign up. Like the um, administration won't isn't setting up teams it's just if students have interest we can set up a team so this year i think there was a couple soccer teams there was a flag football team um but yeah there's there's always interest um so let's organize when you get here <laughs> so just admissions and recruitment we've recruited from big 10 pac 10 um every other g1 program so we do have some serious athletes coming here that's just a joke <laughs> Pretty athletic establishment. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. We do have this incredible facility. Um, they just renovated our athletic complex, and that's been an incredible, another incredible resource that we we're very fortunate to have. And that actually is covered in your fees as well. And so you have access to everything from climbing walls to. Uh, I saw some students actually giving when I was giving tours this summer. I saw some of our, our students on treadmills down there working it out. Um, there's classes you can take throughout the day. If you pay a little extra. There are mas even massages. I mean, you know, who, some of us really love massages. So. <laughs> All right, so we can do that as well. And that is a that facility opened up this fall. It was a little delayed because we hosted the um, the debate here, the second debate here, which is something that we're pretty proud of, proud of. Um, and so, um, but it's a it's a beautiful, great renovated space um, with um, a whole new addition to it that they they completed. So you have access to that as well. If you if for those of you who like to stay active. All right. Um, the other place you can go is uh, rec.wustl.edu. That's the place where you can learn more about intramurals. Um, you can select programs, then um, select intramural sports, and registration will happen later in the summer. And so that's another way you can learn more about what intramural opportunities there are available to you. All right. So this next question is, uh, what is social life really like at the Brown School? So this is assuming um, that you have time outside of class <laughs> and practicum and work and everything else. Yeah, what is social work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a bunch of social workers who believe in community and love being with people. So it's a very social world. Um, I went to a really big undergrad, so I really like how the Brown School is concentrated in three buildings and you walk around and you're always running into classmates and um, there's like essential comments where people eat lunch and um, there, I do feel like there's a sense of community and um, there's just so many students and you overlap with the same students all the time that there's always like a birthday party. There's a birthday party like every week, like a birthday, <laughs> because there's all these, I don't know, social workers that want to celebrate each other. <laughs> and um, I, fi I find that it's, there's no shortage of like wonderful people in the in the Brown School. What's really hard is um, a lot of people are transplants, so you, you have to make an extra effort to get to know people outside of the Brown School in St. Louis, like people from St. Louis. Um, how If you're not from here, like I'm from California, have to come here and get to know a lot of people who are not from St. Louis, like how do you get your foot in the ground in this new city? So that's that's been harder, but now I've been here a year and um, I learned like, it runs a lot on Facebook events in St. Louis. You can find a lot of cool festivals and, and stuff going on, um, like free things in parks um, and all these beautiful parks. And um, there's just always a lot of really great stuff going on in St. Louis. You just have to kind of put in the effort, which, yeah, is tough during the school year, but um, you should do it because it helps. Absolutely. I think it's well, sometimes you got to kind of plan your social time like a, an important meeting that you, you kind of yes. keep it as a very important piece. And, you know, other folks, y'all can chime in. I mean, you live here in St. Louis and, and you all are, you know, young professionals. I mean, we are young professionals. So uh, let's talk. Like, what else do, what, what do y'all get involved in? I love the performing arts scene here in St. Louis. Um, we have some great theaters. The St. Louis Symphony is, is world renowned. Um, the Muni, which is in Forest Park, I'm pointing over there because Forest Park is right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and then lots of free um, music festivals and the Botanical Garden and over at the History Museum again in Forest Park. Um, so there's a lot going on and lots to take advantage of. Yeah. And there's like beautiful parks. 
um, in St. Louis, not just Forest Park, which is right next to um, the Brown School, but Tower Grove Park and Tilly's Park. And it's just beautiful and a lot of hiking places, which I'm gonna just put into. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you like the outdoors, if you're able to get out of St. Louis a little bit, there are a lot of really beautiful hiking trails not too far away, um, in addition to the parks that are in the city. Um, I met a lot of friends outside of the Brown School by playing kickball when I was a student. So um, Tower Grove has a couple different kickball teams that you can join there. A lot of fun. It's a great way to spend your Sunday afternoons just hanging out in the park with friends. So um, that was one of my my best ways to get off campus and meet people when I was a student. Uh, I think one of the most important pieces speaking to I'm a transplant as well, and one of the most important pieces, um, even for folks who are from here, is is um, establishing a community. And so I think that's going to be priority number one for people as you get here, as you kind of orient yourself to our community and to the Brown School, figuring out who on campus and off campus that you want to connect with. What are those things that you have in common with? A uh, kickball, I love that. I, I did some kickball, Tower Grove kickball league. That's a good time. Uh, um, it's like Sunday games sometimes, so that could be a little tough for Mondays, but it could be a pretty good time. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's kickball league, I think there's volleyball. I even found a dodgeball league here in St. Louis. But we have the arts. I mean, folks who probably heard me um, talk about this. I mean, our art scene is an incredible, both visual and performing arts. I mean, with the symphony, with the muni, with black rep, um, there are so many things that you can do. First Fridays, which is not too far from campus, um, in Midtown, where you have a lot of art openings and galleries that you can check out. And then you have places like Cherokee Street that has really small, cool, independent galleries, Maplewood. All these places are, you know, we're so centrally located that everything is really close to us, you know. And then if you like sports, we have baseball, and we have, um, I think we're working on trying to get a minor league soccer team, but we definitely have hockey. Um, and so um, there's, there's that sports culture as well. So there's a lot of different things. And I know there's a couple of students in the public health program that got together and just sampled all the amazing food in St. Louis. So they got like a dinner club going where they would just visit different neighborhoods and try out new restaurants. So that's another yeah, thing. Yeah, I think if you like food, St. Louis is oh, definitely, uh, yeah, you have options here, which is, which I, for a while I, I travel a lot for this job and so I always speak highly of places like Charleston, South Carolina, where there's right. no bad restaurants, you know, places like that. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, when I stop and think about my last 14, 15 years here in St. Louis, I think, oh, yeah, this place is legit. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. frozen yeah. custard and the local fairs as well as uh, uh, other things as well. So plenty, plenty to do. And, oh, we should also mention this. Depending on where you come from, uh, it's inexpensive. So, like, we mentioned free earlier, right? So things are inexpensive, like cheap to free. So, like, socially, like, when you do get out of the books, you can go sit and listen to a free concert and bring your own, like, food and drinks. And, and that's a free event at the Botanical Gardens or at the History Museum of Walk from Campus on Tuesday night. So there's a lot of things you can go out for cheap or free here. It's just, uh, it is. So, yeah, for those of you who come from the coast or whatever else in other locations, <laughs> you, you feel rich for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> you transition. Especially with rent. Yeah. Yes, yeah. rent. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, you definitely feel like you can stretch it out for a while. Yeah. All right, and so um, I know well, potentially we have other questions. Yeah, we have other questions that have come in. I've been assured. So um, the last question we have officially here that's from folks who submitted early. If you could give one piece of advice to an incoming Brown School graduate student, what would it be? I can go. Oh, please. There you are. Um, I would say to trust the process. Um, and not compare yourself to other your peers. Um, you got here you know, on your own merit. You did this on your own, and you have a path that's very unique to you. Your peer may have different path, may get different practicum. You don't have to compare. And if you need some grounding, you talk to amazing staff members that are here at the Brown School, and they will give you a different perspective. Say. Um, Communicate with your academic advisor. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, um, just need help navigating um, concentrations and specializations, never feel like you have to figure out alone. Um, once again, just always be proactive um, through communication and um, just know that your academic advisor is there to help you with, with anything that you need. Um, I would say I'm just, my one piece of advice is a game changer for me this year was um, every time someone gave me a recommendation about St. Louis, I would write it down on a list. And then once a week, I'd try to 
do something new in St. Louis and to check it off the list. And then because it'll be going, like you'll be challenged all the time. Things will be going a thousand miles per hour. And just to, to really, if you're not from here, to start to make it a home and put down roots here is, is really, really important for your sanity, <laughs> for my sanity at least. I think I would recommend just doing learning as much about the programs as you can before you come here. I think there is um, there's a lot that happens really quickly once you're here and the, the time in the program goes by so fast and I think that it's often not enough time to do everything that you want. So I think really try, trying to prioritize what, what courses, what programs you want to be a part of while you're here, um, just doing some research ahead of time before you're in the throes of the program. We can definitely help you navigate things once you're here, but um, if you have time to do a little research ahead of time, that can be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think just as a staff member observing our student experience, this is a place where um, you come to challenge your whatever it is that you bring with you, um, and you come to get challenged, and you come to challenge each other and learn and grow and get stretched. And so, but we all do have one thing in common. Well, we have a lot of privilege, all of us who are part of this community, and we also have uh, the one thing in common, which is that we want to make a difference uh, through health disparities or through a wide variety of areas within social work um, and public health. So uh, we all have that in common. That's our starting place. And so just know that. And then also, I don't want to echo what we shared earlier, that, uh, um, that nobody was given away a spot here for the Brown School that I, I tend to share this with a lot of different groups. If you're here, you've earned it. And so there's going to be that moment where you um, are taking a heavy course load and maybe you're working and maybe you're dealing with some stuff back home or uh, stuff in your personal life and, and things do get overwhelming. Just really connecting people um, and, and take that for granted. Don't let that be interpreted by yourself as, you know, I don't belong here or I must have fooled them, you know, and to get in and I don't really belong here. That imposter syndrome that we talk about a lot. Um, there's no doubt that they may come up for you. Um, come, come to my office, you know, come sit down with me and I'll be like, you're great. I'll never look you up. Oh yeah, you are great. No, uh, no but we'll remind you that there's a reason why you're here. And that you have, a, you don't have to do anything. And we give you three advisors, right? I mean, you, there's no, there's you're, there's a lot of support. So just be vulnerable and open up. And there's people who actually we get, you know, we volunteer or we get paid to help people. That's kind of the central part on our job description. So so you have a lot of support here. Are here to help you out. So it sounds like we do have some questions that have have come in. So I'm gonna look to my partner again, and we'll see what we can do here. All right. Thank you. All right, so good, well, quite a few. Okay, I just want to make sure I don't have Mac. I just want to make sure I use the PCs. All right, all right, so this first question is, uh, I live in St. Charles and I plan on community campus. Um, I did not get a parking pass, so what are my options for parking? It's pretty pretty interesting stuff. One, um, how do you all, do any of you like park on or off campus? And do any of you do that right now? No? I will be parking off campus okay. <laughs> um, starting July 1st. So I did not get a parking pass because I am transitioning, but I'm hoping I get to park in Forest Park and walk. And I've seen a lot of brown school folks as I'm returning <laughs> to <laughs> park um, crossing that street. So um, I know that's done and people currently do that. So yeah, I think quite a few people do the park and ride from the from different metro stops. So there are a few uh, options for metro that um, you can park, like in Shrewsbury or other locations between St. Charles and here. Um, if you have the flexibility to park, come to campus for the day and then leave, um, metro is definitely the way to go. It's really super convenient. The stops are right here on campus. So. Highly, highly recommend that. Absolutely. And then, of course, if you have like one time situations where you need to quickly access your vehicle, um, the parking and transportation does offer shorter term parking options. So, even if you didn't get the full year parking pass through the lottery, you can get, you know, a daily pass uh, for the time that you need to access your vehicle a little bit more close to campus as well. All right, so we have another question there. Um, would the panelists say that it was easy to it, it, that it is easy to get around St. Louis for recreation, grocery shopping, in the campus without a car? Is it easy? Can you navigate your time here without a vehicle? I have a different perspective. I'm from the East Coast, and I would say it's a little tough um, if you don't have a car. 
but if you can stay within the Brown School um, neighborhood, if you're living here, there are um, grocery stores nearby that you can walk to. There are a lot of things you can walk to. It really depends on the um, neighborhood that you live in. But if you are planning to live further away, I think a car is a little bit more useful. Yeah, um, I do have a car, but my roommate doesn't, and she gets to practicum. She gets everywhere. I have several friends that don't. It's it's definitely not the easiest city in the world, to be honest. Um, people like to compare it to other cities a lot, the public transportation quality. But um, if you live close to a way to get to school, um, then then you're good because um, there are ways to, to get other places, but you'll be coming to school most often. So as long as you have that down, then that's my one piece of advice. And there's there are plenty of um, classmates in cars with cars that you'll be connected with shortly, like for, for social stuff, um, and even that you can hop on board with for grocery shopping and things. So as long as you can get to school, um, that's my piece, and practicum, that's my piece of advice. And as an institution, part of your fees covers uh, a metro pass, so you actually will have access to public transportation. It's already covered, so at no additional cost, you can work your way around the St. Louis region uh, with metro, which is a great thing. I know people could probably use that for depending on your practicum side. So other pieces, we have Uber as well for like you know, one-time hits, and there's no reason why people, if, if you can use an Uber and have access to that, and you're able to, um, we're one of the cities that has access to that, and I, I personally find that very helpful um, in getting around St. Louis. Not every city has that. Yeah, there's also um, enterprise car share. There are a few um, share, mm -hmm. shared cars around campus, so you can, um, for shorter trips, that's a really great option if you need to get off campus for an hour or two and bring it back. That's a really easy thing to do, too. Right outside of our building, right? Mm -hmm. Not too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. All right. So we have another question here. If we want to add uh, the MPH to our MSW and even vice versa, uh, do we register like we are a dual degree or do we wait until we're accepted to register for an MSW or MPH for the fall? So the idea here is you're accepted to one program and you want to add the other one. And kind of how do you kind of go through that process in registering? I would recommend that you, um, if you, if you're coming as an MSW and going into MPH, you need your GREs. Um, and you need to make sure you have that done before you enter here. There are some courses that um, you might want to sprinkle in into your first semester if you're MSW from the MPH program so you can get a little bit ahead. Um, but my number one recommendation is to get those GREs in and apply um, and then start talking to your academic advisor. Uh, regardless of which program you're admitted to and you're trying to apply for the other ones, the applications will be available sometime in probably late September. Um, and it is a whole separate application process from the other degrees. So if you have the MSW, you are going to have your GRE requirements and other things. And, and for those of you who are in the MPH program, there is no GRE requirement for the MSW, but there are there's an additional essay and some other things that you'll need to pull together. So you can work with the Office of Admissions and Recruitment for more details on that. And you will want to apply at least starting in your fall semester and, and start preparing for that base. But we do anticipate that we have students who get here start to connect with people um, in the other program or start to even take courses, kind of like you mentioned, and decide they want to commit to it. And so we are more than happy with you on site, take advantage of us being right in your backyard to, to work with you through the application process. All right, so, um, what are the spring courses uh, listed? What are the spring course listings posted? Um, Typically, um, early October. Pre-registration will be in October, and then registration will happen in November. So you'll you'll definitely have plenty of time to review spring course offerings and, and work with your academic advisor to finalize your schedule. All right, that person's really thinking ahead, so that's yeah. good. <laughs> we appreciate it. All right, so um, there's a person who says, I'm concentrating in health, and I've heard that getting practicum in medical centers can be really difficult and competitive. So are there any recommendations for starting this process early? So this is someone who's in the MSW program with respect to health concentration. So any advice there? Sure. I think it's really helpful to touch base with your field advisor as soon as you're able to when you're in the program. So we have um, our field week where you'll get a bunch of different information about the practicum process and then immediately after that we have um, 
time to meet with your field advisor. So I highly recommend meeting with your field advisor then, or even shooting us an email a little bit early um, just to let us know so that we can help connect you with some of our contacts at the different medical centers, um, depending on the, the area within social work and health you're interested in, we can try to connect you with the right, um, the right contacts there. It does help to really plan ahead, um, but there's only so much planning ahead you can do before you're really in the program. Thank you. All right. Um, so the next question here, um, are currently enrolled students given any preference when applying for, uh, to a dual degree? In particular, um, in this case, it's a joint degree between the MSW and the JED program, uh, given that the law school is very competitive. And I'll, I'll just take that one and say that there is no, there is no preference um, for you in the application process. You really have to look at it as a separate application process. Even students who apply to two programs within our program, they're really um, evaluated separately. So you can potentially be admitted to one program and not the other, vice versa. Um, and so, and again, outside of us with the JD program, as you're right, our, our JD program is a competitive program. Um, it's, it's going to really, you want to treat that as a separate application process with its own merit, its own evaluation process. I don't want to say that to discourage you. I just want to be honest with you in that you just set it up with that kind of viewpoint that you're, you're looking at as all those programs as distinct application processes. Make sense? All right, very good. That was pretty direct. I, I felt good I could answer that one. <laughs> um, all right. Um, what are some opportunities for Brown School? for policy-focused students. I can speak to that again. Um, so policy, there are a lot of different types of opportunities for policy at the, um, in your courses, there are a lot of different opportunities to take different policy-focused courses um, and policy analysis and evaluation. And um, there's different levels of interaction with policy that you can have. You can um, do lobbying, coalition building, and um, I forget the end of that course name, but there, there are quite a few um, courses you can filter in as part of your um, policy specialization. You, uh, for practicum, there are a lot of different um, ways of engaging with policy as well. So if you're interested in advocacy, we work with a lot of organizations that do um, very grassroots advocacy all the way up to um, advocating at the state and federal level. We do have opportunities in Jefferson City to, to um, partner with legislators, so you get a really hands-on experience in the Capitol um, partnering with legislators for practicum. So there's um, really a lot of different ways you can approach it, and we can really help um, as field advisors kind of tailor that to, to your interests, um, as well as the specialization chair um, who can work with you to figure out um, kind of how to plan your courses and your practicum so they, they integrate well. And there's a really unique course that during your spring break that you can go to DC if you, um, and I know policy specializations and health policy analysis specializations, students get preference for that as well. All right. Um, so we have a question about proficiency exams, and I'll, I'll pay attention to time. I think we're, we're good for a couple more questions here. Um, if you sign up for a class, then you pass the proficiency exam, how do you add a new class uh, to your schedule at the last minute? So that uh, assumes that you're able to drop one course that you now don't have to take and add a new course to fill in that four to five. So can anybody talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So once again, you will, if you pass a proficiency exam, um, actually I'm going to back up. So can, first off, just register like as if you have, will not pass any, just to be on the safe side to make sure you secure a seat in those required foundation level courses. Then if you do pass an exam, you'll receive an official email from the registrar's office saying that you've been removed from that class. Um, and then I once again recommend that you work with your academic advisor to find, um, take either the next required course in that foundation sequence um, or an elective, but usually it's the next required course in that foundation level sequence. That's great, thank you. All right, so the, I think this is the final question that we have here. Um, before we wrap up, um, when can you expect to receive the U Pass, which is that Metro card that we talked about? Um, are the buses usually on time or on schedule? And so, maybe does it, does anybody navigate our busing system here? Sure, can you talk about it? Um, okay. 
parking can be kind of annoying sometimes, so I do take a bus to school, and it's on time. It's always on time. Yeah. yeah. I, I rode the bus to work, to and from work and from classes for quite a while, and it was very rare that it, the buses weren't on time. It's great to hear. So a lot of information about parking and the UPASS can be found at parking.wustl.edu. That's parking.wustl.edu. So um, you can get more information about that. You'll be able to pick up your UPASS um, once you arrive for orientation as well, so we can navigate that. My hand is back over to my partner. Um, I think that's really all, all that we have at this point. Um, so with that being said, I want to thank you all for taking time this afternoon to spend with us and to give up your time for our, some of our prospective students who are, are going to be joining us this fall. I know that they really appreciate uh, your input and your feedback and your experiences. We want to thank you for watching us today or at least watching our rebroadcast on YouTube. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at the Brown School at Brown Admissions for sure. We're, we're more than happy to, to walk you through and talk you through any of these or connect you with resources that you may find useful in the coming months. Until then, we look forward to seeing you in August. And we have a little bit of information we're going to put over you as we wrap up. Bye.